Greetings and welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am a bass player and songwriter from the Jam City, Dayton, Ohio. Today, I'd like to introduce you to John Henry Sheridan, an artist, a writer, a musician from Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, going to the East Coast today on the You Could Be My Aramis podcast. John is an interesting fella, a kind gentleman, and I think you're going to enjoy getting to know him. Hey there, John. Thanks for stopping by. All right. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mike. We were just talking about this before I hit the record button, but I'd like you to say this for posterity for the people. Uh, first of all, let me know who exactly you are, what you do, and how we met. All right. Who exactly I am? Well, that's a, that's a lifelong quest that I hope to discover some point before my death, but, uh, you know, child of the universe. Um, but I guess in sort of technical governmental terms, my name is John Henry Sheridan. And uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, long time singer songwriter, guitar teacher, guitar player. <clears throat> uh, I went from being born a Catholic, finding my way after years of seeking to being a practicing SGI Buddhist, Nichiren Buddhist. Uh, I'm a diabetic who pra uh, practices veganism. Um, and uh, yeah, music-minded, philosophy-minded. Uh, nowadays, I'm gardening and uh, doing some amateur carpentry. Love to get into nature. So <clears throat> it's kind of a big, uh, you know, a couple of brush strokes about who I am. And uh, how do we meet, right? Um, yes. So, yeah. So you and I, Mike Bankhead and John Henry Sheridan, first cross paths and you might help me remember the name of uh, this Austin bar uh, in 2019 at the CD Baby DIY. I feel like conference. it was Cheer Up Charlie's. Yep, that's the one. Cheer which up is usually a gay bar. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's their normal clientele. Uh, for the conference, the CD Baby conference basically... I don't know if they paid them to rent it out or if they just said we're going to hang out. But basically, the CD Baby Conference took over Cheer Up Charlie's for a specific amount of time each evening instead of their regular comedy shows and whatever else they do. Uh, because one night they had stand up, and I remember the stand up people were upset that we were all there not listening to them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I instead of their regular programming, uh, the conference booked the bar, and that's where the open mic sets were, uh, and some concerts outside. It was a, just a place for all of us musicians to stop thinking about all the education and go watch other musicians play, and then meet people. Yeah, and if you were so inclined, uh, having a chance to perform, too. I, I had a chance to do an open mic, and uh, some people were slotted to perform from the conference, and some just did open mic, and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I'm not much of a performer in the, these past several years, so whenever I get a chance to perform, I, it's kind of meaningful, you know, each performance. Um, yeah, it was a cool vibe, and then I, Mike Bank, Bankhead comes up and says, hey, I'm a, a bass player in a alternative rock band or something to that effect, and I'm like, cool, and he gave me his card, and uh, I think I checked out his music afterward. Like, I remember, Mike, you were one of the guys, one of the few guys who was very um, interested in making contacts and following up with them. And I was one of those guys too. So, uh, you know, sort of like, like minds found each other. But it's cool, if you go to a conference like that and you're meeting people from around not only the country but the world, you might as well make an effort to make it count. And uh, here we are three years later and we're talking, albeit, we only talk here and there throughout the year, but still there's a con there's a connection. Now when I, we go back to Austin this summer, we'll know each other and a few other people, right? Yep. So, so yeah, it's a networking, you know, it, it's more than just uh, broadening one's career. I think networking uh, 
you know, it, it makes life richer, having a broader, you know, broader spectrum of people in one's life. I agree. And there's a couple of uh, important points there. Um, the first important point, a lot of musicians are a little introverted or a lot introverted. And, and a lot of these folks might go to the conference to get more education on the business. And maybe you don't feel like talking to people. And I get it because sometimes I don't. But that's part of the business. So <laughs> if you're going to go to a conference, I implore you, even if you don't feel like it, at least make the effort. I can guarantee you that people are probably not going to be mean to you because we're all there to learn. And mm -hmm. we're kind of all in the same boat. So make the effort. Try to meet somebody. And you also made the point that it's not only always about business. Sure, we have music in common, and we'd like to talk about that. But you might meet someone who's interesting, and you relate to them on a level beyond music. With uh, John, you were kind enough to invite me on your podcast, and I'm trying to find the date because I don't want to give the wrong date. <laughs> it was... Yeah, I can find it if you don't. August of 2021. Sweet, almost a year ago. Yeah, the the YouTube video says August 10th, 2021. And I did not have a podcast then, so I could not reciprocate. But now I can. Right, and I, and I have to say, well, you're, you're very welcome, and thank you for being a guest on the show. That was a fun show to do. And, uh, and then since then, I had my, you know, my eye alert that you were going to start your podcast. And since then, you've quickly outpace the number of episodes that I've done in your less than a year as a podcast podcaster, <laughs> which is cool. It's fun to see that your determination and your re regularity with that. It's inspiring. Well, thanks. My episodes are not as long as yours, uh, which I think helps. When you let people talk about things they're interested in, people can usually be pretty interesting. <laughs> yep. It's this weird magic uh, it's this weird secret that's no secret, but like uh, I often find it if you give people the floor to really just talk about what they they're passionate about, they could talk for 30 minutes. I or the, whoever's the listener might say a couple of words like, oh, wow. <laughs> right. And then by the end of the conversation, they might say, well, wow, that was a great conversation we just had <laughs> that the other person because of they got a chance to really express their passion, even though. It may not have been balanced in terms of who, how much someone spoke and listened. So yeah, giving people a chance to talk, it's incredible. And then I find when, when I do that, I don't know if you see this, Mike, too, but when I let people talk, they become, uh, you know, sort of, they begin to at least trust me. I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to become good friends with everyone that I allow, I listen to, but there's a trust that develops, especially if I don't, if I'm actually listening, you know. Yeah, I agree. It, there's a certain amount of vulnerability and openness required to, to have a, a meaningful conversation with someone, right? Yeah, I'd say so. So while we're on the subject of podcasts, how about you talk for a bit about what your podcast is all about? All right, cool. Thank you. Um, so my podcast is called Music, Philosophy, and More Podcast. Uh, I started it... Um, I think my first episode was June 30th, 2020, something like that. I had long been desiring to do a podcast, a fan of podcasts, just not sure what I was going to talk about. And I always wanted to do interview series, but at that, uh, you know, before 2020, the technology to do interviews was required a little bit of tech savvy that, you know, before Zoom was around that uh, I wasn't, I didn't have the equipment. Maybe I had the know-how, but uh, I didn't have the equipment or the money. But once Zoom popped around and uh, the um, COVID culture came in, my one of my friends, Tom Scuderi, who's been the guest on my show, said, John, it'd be cool if you, you know, you, I was doing Facebook Live shows, and he goes, hey, yeah, if you could bring on your friends, you know, so many people, and talk to them about music. And he said something that, Stuck out, uh, stood out to me, which is, uh, you know, we're all stuck at home. This was like at the beginning of COVID when he was telling me this. We're all stuck at home so and bored. So when someone comes on 
that whose music I like or who's who I'm a fan of or I'm interested in I want I'm going to tune into them for an hour or two hours and it's an escape from you know what he felt was like the depressing time so uh, I'm like hmm so now I wouldn't just be doing it for my ego I would actually maybe be giving people this opportunity to like just tune out of any sort of negative or heavy media and just to, to listen to you know two guys or a guy and a girl have a conversation and you know people could just be a fly on the wall and just hang out and I was going to gear the podcast towards something which is just like everyday people uh, and you know people that I know not like trying to make it about anyone who's had X amount of sales or X amount of success if someone does great but that doesn't matter it's just heart to heart communication as if like I was hanging out in my basement talking to a friend and the listener, let's say you're listening, you and a handful of other people are in the basement listening to me talk to this friend, and you guys are talking to, it's kind of like this hanging out in the basement vision that I had, and keeping it light and keeping it encouraging, and keeping it about ordinary people. I, I didn't, what I mean by ordinary, I didn't, I was always annoyed when I listened to podcasts over the years that I always felt some degree of jealousy, even if it's like a DIY podcast. It's like, we're interviewing this person who just had, you know, 1,000 signups to their mailing list last week. And can you tell us about that? So that's not a huge thing, but for me, I didn't have 1,000 mailing list signups. And, you know, even little victories, if you're focusing on this like outward goal rather than just someone's life condition, life story, it creates a little bit of jealousy or angst or whatever so I, I want to create a podcast that didn't really have that type of energy you know so I hope I'm succeeding at it and it, it doesn't matter to me if there's just a handful of listens or a ton I'm just gonna keep doing it because I find it enriching and you know satisfying I think you're definitely succeeding and the the, the just having a chat in a basement feel is very much what I felt when you were kind enough to invite me. We talked for two hours and 49 minutes. <laughs> That's a really long podcast, but it didn't feel like that long actually doing it to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it definitely didn't feel like extensively long or anything. It's just like we're just having a good time hanging out and no point in rushing it because we're hanging out, you know. So let's get to your origin story. We know you're a musician. How did you learn how to play? All right. So um, let's say um, Guns N' Roses video for Sweet Child of Mine comes out. I don't know if it came out in 88. I'm guessing around 88. That's 87 or 88. Well, you yeah, keep talking. Album, I'll Google it. The album came out in 87, summer, and the video, might I might have first saw it in 88 or so. Uh, a sweet child of mine, and there he is, the opening lick slash is playing do 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 do. <clears throat> Hard to sing that riff, and uh, and then the band comes in, the strumming, they all look super cool and kind of bad, you know, like pretty badass. But I knew like there was something poisonous about them, but that you know that my grandma might not approve. But uh, you know, I was seven years old, so but that. I kind of liked it and I don't know after seeing that video and then a handful of others or whatever was on MTV at that era I got curious and then and I want to play guitar so then fast forward to you know that that feeling came and went a little bit <clears throat> then in 91 Guns N' Roses release Usual Illusions 1 and 2 Metallica releases the Black Album Enter Sandman's on TV, Don't Cry, Guns N' Roses on TV, then Unforgiven, and then Nirvana, uh, Smells Like Teen Spirits on TV. All this, these incredible songs, which I didn't realize what a treasure it was at that time, of course, but it was, seemed interesting. And I'm like, I want to make sounds like that, yeah, especially that Metallica, Guns N' Roses sound I like. And uh, so I begged my mom. It took a while. That was like fall 91 that I kind of got serious about wanting a guitar, I guess, even though I wanted it for a few years. And then she said like, if 
you do good on your next report card, we'll get you one. And then I had some like save money and I bought an amp and that ended up being, let's say March 92 or something. So uh, I let it, I took it home, had this rock ax Fender Strat style guitar, white. And I'm like, you know, plugging it in, getting these sounds. I'm like, this sounds nothing like Guns N' Roses, nothing like Metallica, this sucks, you know? Nobody to teach me, no YouTube videos. You know, I'm only 11 years old. I'm sliding my finger up the fretboard and back down. Then I just put it down the corner and it gathers dust for probably six months or so. And then I think uh, September-ish, 92, my friend who was away for the summer comes back. Uh, kind of a troublemaker guy, but he, his name John too. He, he came over and he said, hey, you got a guitar? Cool, let me see. And I brought it to him and he played bing, 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 bing. The first few notes to one from Metallica. And I was like, whoa, you could do that? And then he played Enter Sandman a little bit. So he taught him to me and then I was off to the races and uh, I got uh, proper lessons at that time, learning how to read notes which was fairly boring, but uh, helpful. It did help me later on when, when I was a teacher to understand how to motivate kids and what's not motivating. And So then by 93, I was getting pretty good because I played a lot of hours in the basement. And then I had my first gig with like uh, two other guys at my cousin's birthday party and we were playing some like punk songs plus like Dock of the Bay and <laughs> whatever we could manage. Uh, so then by 94, I had a metal band. By 96, we were pretty good. And 97, I was playing in uh, CBGBs in New York City and the bank and other nightclubs. And, you know, we practiced in my, the, the basement of my home, which my, my mother's home, and made a lot of noise and had a, a entourage, a crew that we hung out with. and. You know, but we were kind of cool in the sense that we didn't, you know, we didn't cause too much trouble. We were really noisy, but we weren't really getting wasted. We weren't really starting fights or vandalizing. We were just kind of doing our thing, and it was pretty fun. So nowadays, and by the way, it's cool that you played a, a club as legendary as CBGB's. Um, <laughs> nowadays, when you write, What's the first tool you reach for when it's time to write a song? Oh, man. Uh, I don't really even remember the last song I wrote. I wrote so many that it got to the point that uh, I just didn't want to write anymore. I just wanted to keep releasing whatever wasn't released yet. And I saw them putting out sort of like these, uh, uh, not post-mortem, but these like archive collection albums for the past few years. Um, but let's say... I don't know, if I was going to write a song now, uh, I guess it would be kind of purpose-driven. So, like, I've been asked to write songs before, so I've written, like, I've helped, uh, did the score to two children's musicals or family musicals. I, one time, this, two times, this guy, uh, this environmentalist from Kenya asked me to write songs that he could sing with with kids he was teaching about environmental stuff. So in that case, he sent me concepts. I put the words that he gave me, I kind of made them so there was some lyrical flow. And then I put simple chords. Um, if I'm just expressing myself, that would be totally different, you know? Generally, it would be acoustic guitar and then just uh, playing and just seeing where it goes and then I might once I get like the general form of a verse chorus, then I might stop and just write more uh, lyrics for the next verse chorus, next verse chorus, and then, then experiment just hearing what it sounds like. Uh, but yeah, to say nowadays, I really don't know. I, I've been, I jam with my son who's, who just turned seven. He likes playing drums. Um, but I, I really can't remember the last uh, time I compose something from beginning to end at this point. It's kind of funny. Wow. Do you think your writing days are behind you? Um, well, uh, it's a play on words because uh, my writing days are definitely not behind me. I'm writing all the time, but uh, writing book, books. Um, 
uh, but writing music, yeah, I have no interest in writing music right now. Um, and I don't mean that in any like dramatic way. I just, that's how I genuinely feel. And if I have, I remember I moved from Japan back to the US in 2012 and I told my friend like, man, I don't even want, I didn't have a guitar in the US at the time. Like, I don't even want to get a guitar. I just want to see if I could build up a new life here. And a week after I said that, I bought two guitars. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. And, you know, I was trying not to hold myself to my words because that's just how I felt that week. And then the next week I felt differently. So I, I might write an album before the end of the year, but I doubt it, you know, but who knows. All right. So let's switch and talk about pros. You have a book already available called Mind Your Music. Would you like to talk about that? Sure, thank you. Um, so Mind Your Music, uh, I'll read the uh, blurb in the back. Um, music is sound vibrations that can and do affect us, but is all music good for us? Throughout his many years of musical experience in various roles, um, John Henry has come to learn the vital importance of paying close attention to the music in our lives. He believes our everyday music choices can significantly impact our overall health and well-being. Uh, so the music is kind of a, an argument, for lack of a better word. It, it's me. I regard it as a philosophy book. Uh, on the genre, I put mind, body, spirit, slash music. It's like, okay, I'm not going to convince anyone of the science because I that's totally unnecessary to me if someone needs the science for convincing then my book may not be for them and this is for someone who's just open to kind of trust that here's a guy who spent 20 plus years uh, devoting his life to music and he's also you know health conscious and spiritual wonder what he has to say about music and you know so basically I, I, I suggest that music is very powerful what is what is music if you go to the history of humanity what is it you know like to bring the tribe together to unite people on the battlefield to pass the time that, that's what music is and then somehow it became the commodity and i think with that commoditization if that's the right pronunciation uh you know it became uh open to a lot of potentially toxic just toxic uh, energies just like our food has been doctored so much that it's very it's much harder to find healthy food than it is to find unhealthy food so similarly uh it's much easier to find unhealthy music than healthy music i would i would suggest but i but i'd say the majority of music is gray area so it's for each of us to determine what is healthy or unhealthy for us <clears throat> but to just be aware that that's the environment we swim in and that you know if you listen to, you know, really angry music a lot and you find yourself really angry, there could be a connection. Or if you listen to really depressing music all the time and you find yourself down now, is there a connection? You know, so it's just drawing people's attention to that, not telling anyone what to do, but giving some sort of map as to how to look at it, healthy, gray area, and unhealthy music, and then some questions one can consider to find the best music for each person. You know, we, we each can find the best music for our lifestyle and for our preferences. That's basically the gist of it. Do you have another book in progress now? Uh, yeah, and just before I mention that, I'll just quickly say I have um, three guitar books that I published. Uh, one's called Single String Songs, Volume 1. Then there are two other single string songs books, and those are to learn how to play guitar using one string. And it's with numbers on one line. It's like the most basic tablature you can imagine. And pretty fun, and it's been, the method's been taught and used all over the country actually, even in schools. And uh, a few, uh, I know there was one teacher using it in Germany and probably a couple other countries. Um, so it's getting out there. It is effective. Single String Songs, Volume 1, if anybody wants. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's on my website. Um, if anyone's curious to learn how to play in a really simple, friendly way. Uh, the book 
I'm working on now is kind of like my, my magnum opus. Are you a fan of uh, Lord of the Rings? I am not. I've never read it. I lean more towards science fiction uh, than fantasy if I'm going to read fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not writing fiction or fantasy, but I say that because I, I remember I, my, uh, my father's favorite book was Lord of the Rings. He passed away when I was young, so I always kind of paid attention to it. And uh, I remember hearing that it basically from the first book to the last, the three is a trilogy. Uh, he conceived of it as a whole, which was interesting. Not as like one book and then he wrote a sequel. He conceived this as a, as a whole and it took him 10 years to write it. Uh, roughly, that's what I remember hearing, maybe nine years. So anyway, this my book that I'm working on is, uh, and that's J.R.R. Tolkien who wrote Lord of the Rings. My book um, is my autobiography. And so far I, I like officially started in spring of 2020. And now it's summer of 2022, and I, I can't, I'm not even sure that I'm halfway done. Maybe. I mean, I've done a ton of work on it, a lot of words and a lot of research and a lot of documents around it. Um, but it's just, it's the best, kind of like you said, your podcast is your <clears throat> doctor's orders, uh, or perhaps you, you might regard it as like really great uh, self-therapy or something to that effect. Writing my um, autobiography is the best therapy session I could ever do, so I'm in no rush to finish it. But at the same time, I really do want to complete it and have it out there for people to enjoy. Um, the title is, uh, the tentative title is um, Truth Seeker, uh, a, uh, a Life in Context, 1980. To 2020, so I just work with the first 40 years. I'm gonna end it with my uh, 40th birthday around that, which is December 2020, and then actually I'm gonna do a prequel within the book of like the pretty much all of uh, recorded history <clears throat> up to my birth. Uh, not that like I'm some <laughs> that I deserve this prequel more than anyone else, but we all. If we arrived at, in the Earth at any point, all the history of humanity and potentially then the universe, really, really is, is, is our shared history. So I, I kind of like, I'm cherry picking some things from all of human history to kind of create this like prequel chapter. And then I'm going to focus on, you know, the, the 19th, the 20th century, like all the dates, like when the major wars happened and when grandparents were born and stuff like that, kind of make it this kind of fun big picture thing that leads to my birth um and of course anybody in the world could do it it's, i'm not highlighting that i'm more important than anyone else but i just think it's a fun way to look at one's life as i write each year i'm doing like each chapters a year so 40 chapters plus the prequel uh each year in my life i'm really trying to dig in to find out as much about that year and my life in that year as possible but I'm putting in plenty of context, like 1985, um, my brother was born, so that's easy year to remember. And then that summer, The Goonies comes out. That summer, Back to the Future comes out. And we then, you know, we went on vacation upstate, so I could tie in what was happening. Uh, also, um, We Are the World was big in 19, the early 1985. So just trying to, t you know, these touch points, like, Super Mario Brothers 3 comes out in 1990. What was that like? That was amazing. And, you know, writing about that experience as I'm telling you about my life, telling the reader about my life, you, if, you, if you're the reader and you've a similar age group to me, uh, a similar culture of context, you're going to be able to relate and say, oh, shoot, I remember when I first played Mario Brothers or whatever it is, when I first uh, saw Back to the Future. So that's what the context part is. You know, I feel it's a way to be relevant uh, as a book since, you know, you know, if I'm not a historical figure or a famous person, how can I make my autobiography interesting for a wider audience, you know? When you say 1985, the first thing I thought of was the Chicago Bears. Okay, did, did they win the Super Bowl that year? Uh, yeah, the Super Bowl was in 86 because it's always the next year, but that team was, uh, they went 15-1. and one. And their defense was just a 
complete wrecking crew, and I am by no means a Bears fan. Uh, but I'm almost, I mean, I'm a little older than you, so I, I was born in 77, so I was eight. I turned eight that year, but mm-hmm. I remember that team really vividly. Yeah. As a, as a sports lover, if I were to do a similar autobiography, I would probably have to frame it on what was happening in the world of sports every year. Yeah, yeah, well, and that that's what's so cool. It's like all these entry points, you know, like I wonder in a couple of years when I finish this, I wonder if I could maybe create a course to teach people how to write an autobiography or or like just whether they publish it or not just because there's so many entry points into uh into discovering you know when i first saw this there was so much vague uh you know fuzzy memories about you know huge swaths of my life which which is probably the case for probably most people but uh as i was able to find entry point like you said chicago bears 85 season and then 86 Super Bowl you could research things you could put them on a on a timeline then you could start crafting okay I remember when I watched the Super Bowl I ate uh, you know Breyer's chocolate ice cream that night and then you can create a little bit of a a vignette in there you know and then all of a sudden there's something in in an autobiography let's say you're writing it of your life that that's in time and the more the more those and of course there's creative license and it's not like doesn't have to all have happened but to be something that's kind of similar to what your experience of life was or mine you know uh, I think it's fun for for readers and then I I like I just have this curiosity about timelines so I don't really believe time is real but I know that you know it's kind of like there's this phrase um, know the truth but respect the illusion Uh, it certainly seems real uh, to me, so I'm just trying to play with it <clears throat> and try to make sense. It's fun when things come together on a timeline. And so, like you said, if you're a sports guy, you would be able to piece together a lot more of your life than you might think by looking into the sports timeline. And then you can bring in the music timeline when certain of your favorite albums came out. And it doesn't have to be, you know, of course, I'm including albums that came out when I was three that later influenced me. But at the same time, as I write the context, here I am, three years old, watching the Smurfs on TV, and Metallica's putting out, you know, Ride the Lightning. So uh, I put it all in, you know, I just kind of mix these timelines that relate to my life. And, and you know, and, and it's a fun experience. And I think every time I've read people a little bit of it, they I don't get very far before someone kind of interrupts and says, yeah, yeah, I remember when I blah, 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 and that's what I want. I want people to think about their own life and how rich each of our individual lives can be. So talking about life events and, and things from the past, what is the earliest song that you can remember hearing? Oh, wow. That's a, <laughs> that's a cool question. I definitely never, uh, never formally thought about it. Uh, that might have to be my new I just came up with that and you're the reason I came up with that because I was thinking about those memories you were mentioning and you mentioned specifically about music that might have come out like when you were three but Mm -hmm. it ended up being influential and I've been looking for a question that I could ask every single guest Uh, I've stolen one from someone else but I think I I think you might have actually helped me find the question (laughs) Cool. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and, and I'll answer that in a second. Another fun question I remember, uh, I think a few people ask it. I know Tim Ferriss was asking it, is which is the book you've gifted the most in your life or something like that? You've given other people? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, anyway, but yeah, this is a cool one. I like this one a lot. So the first song I ever remember hearing, I really have no idea, but I, I could tell you the first few, like the earliest impressions I could remember. Probably Beat It would be like the earliest song I could kind of officially say that. Actually, I remember it was that song, you know. Uh, Beat It, I was really impressed with the sound of it. I thought it was super cool. Um, And then uh, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Cyndi Lauper. And then uh, Billy Joel, Moving Out. Those are some of the earliest songs I remember hearing and liking a lot. You know, just kind of fun vibe. 
beat it 1982 uh, on, of course, the the Thriller record. Yeah. So on that one, was it like the beat that drew you? Because it's got a pretty iconic start with a, right? But like, or was it Eddie Van Halen shredding on the guitar? Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure it was uh, just that kind of da 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 da, and then basically beat it. It's probably that chorus, you know, when I'm two or three years old. Actually, you know, I was I was one in 1982, so um, probably I heard it when I was like three or four. You know, a cousin might have brought it over, or, or it was heard on the radio in between. But I remember like thinking about how cool that was. And I guess knowing that it was a thing already, probably when I was three or four, maybe my cousin brought it over or something. But yeah, I, I think I was completely oblivious to guitar. I remember it wasn't until maybe, I don't know, like 90, until, until I was nine, 10, 11, that I even understood what a drum was, like, or a bass. It was just like the song. I, I, I saw the singer, I got that, but how any of the other sounds came about, I had no idea which was which, you know? I remember finally realizing later on when I was 10 or 11, like, oh, that's a drum. That's what a drum sounds like, you know? That music video was still in regular rotation in the 90s, early 90s on MTV. True. Yeah, I mean, it's such a good music video. And Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Cindy Lauper's cover of that, the internet tells me that came out in 83. Yeah, right. I, I, she, uh, that was her song. So I, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I, my mom had that album, that record on vinyl. So she played that around the house. I remember seeing that She's So Unusual weird album cover. I remember Madonna and Cyndi Lauper were this like competing thing. Uh, I just felt like they were like a pair kind of, you know. Now, of course they're not, <laughs> but no. that's how I felt as a kid. The internet tells me that that song was written by Robert Hazard in 1979 Whoa. and covered by Cyndi Lauper in 83. I don't think I ever... I remember hearing that song as a child. I don't think I ever knew or ever thought that Cyndi Lauper was a pop star. Like, Madonna was ubiquitous, so I... It's hard not to remember that craziness, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The outfits yeah, sure. were kind of like to an elementary school kid in the 80s. Crazy outfits, right? But uh, mm -hmm. I yeah. can't look back and remember thinking that Cindy Lauper was famous, but I obviously remember that song. Wow, okay. Yeah, I guess because my mom owned the album. I'm sure that song and a few others were definitely on the radio, but Madonna certainly eclipsed her in terms of being in your face, and she was more of like the, the fame, fame-based one, I guess. But yeah, I, that surprised me. So... So this guy Hazard wrote it in 79, and did anyone else perform it? His or band did. The I internet did. says it was called, I mean, it's wiki, so take it with a grain of salt. His band was called Robert Hazard and the Heroes. Wow. It makes sense, you know. Um, I'm a little surprised, but uh, sometimes those, like, really classic hits uh, are epically classic because they were so good. You know, so it makes sense that it's a cover. Like, uh, like um, what's it called? Uh, Come on, feel the noise, which I associate with Quiet Riot, and probably. Yeah, I think everyone probably does. Yeah, it's actually not a Quiet Riot song. Who knew? You know, uh, I don't. I mean, I think most people wouldn't know that unless they're kind of a, a rock history buff. I forget even the name of the band who wrote it, but I don't know if it was Slade or. Sweet, maybe one of those two, but... Well, I didn't know it was a cover, so see, I just learned something. Yeah, so sometimes with those, like, really killer tracks, you know, I, I guess for an artist, for an artist like Cyndi Lauper, I guess probably a lot of her songs were written with songwriters or co-written anyway, so... Yeah, Time After Time was co-written. That's the song I think of first when I think about her, which is, that's a really good song. Uh, it's but good. Yeah, she actually co-wrote that. Yeah, she has a lot of really good songs. I like Good Enough a lot, the Goonies song. Um, apparently she doesn't like it that much, but it puts me in a good mood. I like it a lot. I'm sure she probably likes the royalties that she's still getting for it. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I think so. I, I remember hearing that, like that, that she doesn't like it that much, and then that Van Morrison doesn't actually like the song Brown Eyed Girl, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, Brown Eyed Girl, you know, because that's probably what everyone associates him with. You yeah. Know, unless they're a big fan of his, you know. It's a pop song with mass appeal. I get why a person that feels like they're a serious artist would probably not like their silly little pop song very much. Yeah, especially if it's not a true story to him, if it's just a song of, like with a story built in that he doesn't relate to, it's like whatever, you know? However, as a songwriter, I feel like if I had a song that was paying my bills, I could learn to like it. Yeah, you would think so, right? I, I, I sense that... I would probably uh, certainly appreciate it anyway. Uh, funny side note on that, I, I had one song that I was earning some royalties for, uh, which was on the TV show um, Dog the Bounty Hunter. <clears throat> Somehow I got a friend of mine helped me to get a land a placement of one of my songs on that. Uh, and the song's called Lack of Faith, which is so funny because, you know, I. I after that went out, I, I later became a Buddhist leader and stuff and was encouraging people in faith for, for a long time. And so I wasn't exactly proud of having a song, Lack of Faith, be like my biggest commercial success. And I, I'm saying it earned me royalties. I mean, you know, probably in the three digits over the years and not, nothing major. But um, it's nice to get it, you know, to earn a little couple dollars uh every year coming in from a song uh but yeah but i could at least get a taste of man if that was song was really big and earning me a lot of money and it's a song that i don't really believe in or stand for that would bother me you know i i don't have anything synced yet so congratulations for breaking into that part of the business it's a it's a tough tough shell to crack for some for some genres like mine yeah it is I, and it's thank you um i don't uh i don't know that it it was uh I, it was just kind of like a one hit wonder type of lucky thing connection thing i guess i don't feel like it helped me to get anything else synced and nothing else i got was synced which always annoyed me you know i wish like and I tried, I joined Taxi for, for a couple of years and I submitted things, but I wasn't willing to play the game properly, which is like find, look at a listing, what are people looking for, create that song, go refer to the reference artist and create something in that style. That's not, you know, it's not, not enough originality or true expression in that for me to spend the time it would take in a highly competitive field, so. I'm not really a producer, or, you know, at heart. Like, something I can do, but not something I really naturally do, so. Oh, well, see, that's something I can't do. Uh, you know, I, uh, I hire professionals to engineer and produce my records. And so, like, I'm going to write what I'm going to write. I don't mind writing to a prompt. And I know more or less what some of the themes they want in sync are. And I have some songs that fit that. But I'm going to write the songs I want to write, and it feels like the sync world is heavily slanted toward pop music these days, mm -hmm. and I don't write pop music, so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would say I gave up on it, but yeah, I hear you, man. You're, you're the type of artist, from what I could tell, that you really come from the heart, or, or just from your pure, pure nature, your pure expression, that's what it seems like, so... Yeah. And, you know. you know, as an artistic exercise, I could write a song from a different point of view or about something specific, but I would feel strange trying to write a modern pop arrangement with all the, you know, in the box toys that modern pop music consists of. I feel like if one of my songs ended up produced like that, I'd almost probably just write the song, send the demo to someone else and let them do the rest, you know? Yeah, it's uh, it's not a world I'm I'm a fan of. I've dabbled in it with at these conferences because I've been to a Taxi conference. Are you familiar with what Taxi is? Uh, yeah, I've not joined it because it, the price looks kind of ridiculous. And again, I don't think my genre is all that friendly for sync. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't particularly recommend it, especially 
in your situation if you're going to stick to your genre i wouldn't really say so it's more for like flexible producers of music i mean of course genre specific things work but it seems like flexibility quick turnaround high production value that's what they're looking for and you know, I, I'd rather sleep at night. Yeah, the but, quick turnaround uh, is I just don't have that ability. Was the uh, was the taxi conference at least okay? I heard that's in L.A., and it, it's rumored to be one of the good ones. Right. I don't particularly recommend taxi unless you're that type. Like I said, quick turnaround. You know, you're just willing to, like, work at creating soundscapes or song. You know, for artists, it's questionable. But the conference was a lot of fun. I really liked the guy, Michael who's who leads taxi um I forget his last name but he was quite a friendly guy i don't know if i met him but he was leading things uh the but the best thing at the back about that conference for me was i met <clears throat> bob baker there and bob baker is a uh, this an author uh diy author also uh you know sort of a coach for independent musicians and independent authors and uh i've have this long relationship with him. Bob Baker was at uh, our conference. He was at um, Cheer Up Charlie's that night. Uh, so I don't know if you met him. Have you heard of Bob Baker before? I have not. I do recommend his stuff. He's got a lot of books that are encouraging, very upbeat uh, for independent-minded DIY people. You know. Um, anyway, so that I, I regard him as like kind of like my book, my writing mentor in a way. Um, not that I'm like on the phone with him. I've had a few interactions with him, but just reading his writings is enough, you know. And I did hire him as a coach a few times for feedback and stuff. So that was the best thing to came out, come out of the Taxi Road Rally, which I went to 2013. And then I went to ASCAP Expo uh, twice, 2014, 2018 which also had a lot about sync stuff and everything. And, and then, you know, CD Baby Conference has touches on that too, for sure. Uh, it's, it's just not for me. I explored it and uh, it's not my, not my cup of tea. I feel like for that to work for me, I would need to know all of the briefs that are required at a given time because then I would know if I have anything existing in the catalog that would match. And that knowledge is something that I do not have, unfortunately. Well, what happens is, is they, if you join something like Taxi, they, you get sent listings constantly. Every week, I don't know if every day, but often, of, you know, looking for an artist that sounds like Pink, you know, for a song in this type of uh, genre, <clears throat> or looking for an artist that sounds like Willie Nelson, whatever. Uh, a lot of times it's stuff that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, but occasionally you'll get something in my own genre. But basically I found I would just submit tracks that were in my, uh, my archives, my database. And it's just, it's never, it, they want something usually very specific. So just kind of hoping that you have something in your catalog that's a match. It, for me, it was just a far cry, especially because the production level does matter. Yeah. You know, uh, they, they, it has to compare with what other people are, these like really, you know, skilled uh, composers and producers are, are doing. Um, it just, it was silly for me because I wasn't willing to train myself to be that. Yeah, and just like finding something in a catalog and throwing it, it was kind of wasting money every time. I would even, very rarely even get any feedback, so. That's the least helpful. Feedback would be very nice. Yeah, yeah, anyway, that, that, was, uh, that was that. But I was thinking on, not that you, uh, not that I'm telling you you should write a book or shouldn't, but uh, just want to mention again if you are a history buff and I know you're you are you certainly can write songs and uh, and I did read some of your blog. I remember something about you in France uh, seeing a perform seeing a concert and uh, that was well written. So anyway, I know I know you can write um, and having this like historical. Just mentioning it, like as a something to, I don't know, kind of toy around with as just a pure expression, and really for the posterity, because that's how I'm looking about at my book. Uh, you know, not 
I'm not expecting to make money from my autobiography. I do hope that a handful of people will buy it and I'll get some royalties to offset whatever costs I put into it. But I'm just more interested that people will have it, hold it. It's like, it'll be like a history book as much as an autobiography uh, from a perspective. And history is always from a perspective. So, you know, and so we all have a perspective living in an interesting time. And the, the time period we've grown up in is fascinating. So much has happened. So uh, to have a through line, like one common perspective that's kind of saying how living in this time was, I just think that's valuable in and of itself, you know? And even if it could be really sh brief, you know, well, there's all sorts of books. Um, but yeah, just throwing it out there that I don't think, I think everybody's life story is worth telling if, if someone is so inclined to tell it, you know? I am, I think I agree with you. I mean, I think we both agree that people are interesting and I feel like I am more interested in other people than I am in myself. So maybe there's someone out there that's more interested in me than they are in themselves too. Sure. Yeah. I get that. Uh, last question. This is one I stole from Terry Martin, who was a podcaster here in Dayton on the now defunct Gem City podcast. What did your childhood smell like? <laughs> Yeah, definitely a uh, very good question, just like the uh, first song thing. Um, I, I'm going to go the funny route because uh, I think that's kind of intended to be a little funny. Anyway, that's I'm hearing it right now. Uh, definitely uh, there was poop and pee pee in the kitchen very regularly because we had a big dog who would uh, we had laid down papers at night and there would be dog poop and and urine in the kitchen most mornings. And uh, I, I had the, uh, the privilege to clean it up many times. And I totally forgot about that. I it wasn't gonna go into my autobiography because I had no mem memory of that, but now that you say, what did it smell like? It's a totally different window. That's a great window into remembering the past. That's got to. That's got to go in there. Now you got to. Now you got to have a part in it about your assignment to get up first thing in the morning, be tired, and have to clean feces off the kitchen floor. Yeah, it, 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 there's something about that. I mean, that does add to my character because later on I would like uh, get the garbage duty and stuff like that, and I was never squeamish about it. And I think it started from there. Um, of course, the smell of cooking, uh, you know, my grandmother's house, I remember the smell of like potatoes and fried potatoes and onions, fried potatoes and fried onions, probably with some sort of meat or fish. Uh, then the smell of um, the grass, cut grass when I was in Norway or just, you know, living in Marine Park here in Brooklyn. Um, those are a couple of things I remember. Uh, the smell of... Uh, <laughs> I almost cursed there, the smell of cigarette smoke. My mother, you know, was a smoker and grandpa, a lot of people smoked around me. So the house always stunk, which really sucked. And then in the summer, windows closed, air conditioner on all the time with the smoke in the house. Fortunately, the air conditioner is blowing the air into the kitchen, but um, yeah, uh, I definitely think my, my life smells better now. That's good. That's a good answer. So people can find you at johnhenrysheridanmusic.com. That's all one word, folks. John with an H, johnhenrysheridanmusic.com. You also have a Facebook page, a YouTube channel, and I'll be linking to both of those things in the show notes. Is there anything else that you'd like to promote or that you'd like to tell people to go find that you do? Uh, I think that's about that. Um, on the... Uh YouTube channel or on my website um, John Henry Sheridan music com you can find uh, my uh, my podcast <clears throat> or just straight on my YouTube channel John Henry Sheridan music um, I also have John Henry guitar lessons com but uh, you know I'm not actively doing it but it's there it's a resource for beginner and intermediate guitar players if anyone's interested 
Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Mike. You know, this was fun. I'm Thank you, John. I, do it. I enjoyed it. And, uh, I mean, we're only we're less than a month away from the CD Baby Conference in Austin. So I'll see you down in Austin in four weeks. And, dear listeners, if any of you are headed to Austin for the CD Baby Conference, uh, try to find John. Try to find me. We'll talk to you, right? Yep. That'll be fun. All right. Thank you. All right, Mike. Be well. I'll see you in, in about a month or so. Thanks again to John Henry Sheridan for joining me, and I'm looking forward to seeing him again in Austin for the CD Baby DIY Musician Conference. Hey, dear listener, this Friday on the podcast, I've got another person who you can meet if you're a musician and you go to the CD Baby DIY Musician Conference. You'll have to stick around and come back Friday to find out who that is. Yeah, that's a tease. A tease here on the You Could Be My Aramis podcast. Thank you, dear listener, for being with me, and I warmly invite you to come back on Friday. Thanks. Bye.